And a very happy Christmas to all of you as well, after that great list of all the things that have happened this year to us. When I was coming up here tonight, I was trying to remember if I'd ever been in this building before. And I remember being at an opening of a building up here in late 1992, around the time of the currency crisis. And um, it was a Friday afternoon. I was working in the Sunday Business Post for Patworks now. And uh, there was the currency crisis was ongoing. And we'd had a tip off that it was very, the government was seriously, despite all the things it was saying, was very close to devaluation of the currency and making a decision. So I was sent off to try and interview Bertie Hearn as Minister for Finance, who was here for the opening either of this building or something else here on the street. Uh, it was this building, was it? 92, yeah. 92, yeah, I think it was. So that was the only time I've been here before. And uh, Bertie was waiting for somebody else to come along. Of course, it was his own constituency as well, so it was very important for him to be here. So I started trying to talk to him about the likelihood of a currency devaluation. And it was my first experience of learning that you could talk to Bertie Hearn and find out absolutely nothing. <laughs> and I suppose it was a signal of the way our relationship was to go for the following 17 years as well. And then we got into the situation as well, having asked him the questions, and he'd... Um, is, you, is any of you who might know, or former Tisha who might know, that the social chit-chat is not something that he actually engages in or he indulges in an awful lot. So there were a lot of sort of long silences where I was desperately trying to think up some other way of trying to ask him the question that he would not answer. And uh, it was an awkward, embarrassing 10 or 15 minutes before somebody came along to open the building. So that was my one occasion up here. <laughs> but funnily enough, devaluation been the thing then. Of course, it's something that's not open to us now. And you know, of the many crises that we're actually facing at the moment, one of the big issues is our currency. And it's one of the things that very much our exporters are struggling at the moment because of the fact the strength of sterling and the strength of the dollar, sorry, the weakness of sterling and the weakness of the dollar against uh, the euro leaves us in a very difficult position. And we got out of the economic mess that we were in in late 1992, early 1993, by the devaluation of the currency. And it was absolutely central to the economic boom that followed afterwards. And it's just another one of the things that is actually not available to us at the moment. And it's not just a question at the moment of one hand being tied behind our back. It seems that we've both hands tied behind our back. And we seem unwilling to face up to the necessity to actually give ourselves a little bit more freedom to deal with things. You know, coming up, I was thinking, you know, that, you know, Things are dreadful at the moment. I don't think there's any way to put it. Now, we do have enormous improvement on previous generations. I mean, we don't have, even putting it down to very basic things, we don't have the infant mortality that we used to have in the past. We don't have the dire poverty that people used to live in. We have better life expectancy. We do have a much better standard of living. We have much better educational attainments. And we have, at this stage, the most educated uh, population that we've ever had. So those are all very much positives. And you know, even for all the downside of the building bubble, we actually do have a much better housing stock now, even if I would still argue that an awful lot of it wasn't built to the standards that they should have been. And we do have an awful lot of new buildings that have made Dublin in particular and other parts of the country look a lot better, even if a lot of them were completely and utterly unnecessary. So there are things that you know, we can say that are positives, but I would be very worried about a whole range of things that maybe when we get to the Q&A we can go to, and I'd love to hear your views as well on all of this, but we have an absolute banking crisis which NAMA has not fixed and will not fix. Uh, it's starting to look very much like the valuations on which a very clever looking idea by which money could be given to the banks by the presentation of bonds given by the government to the European Central Bank, raise money, get money for liquidity flowing in the economy again. It doesn't look like it's going to work because the price uh, for that is government is prepared to pay to the banks for these um, for these dodgy loans and bad loans is simply not going to work and they're going to have to be priced an awful lot lower and the banks are going to go bust and we are facing nationalisation of the banks and that means that we're going to end up with the cost of the nationalisation of the banks, the main banks, on the government balance sheet and that's going to add dramatically to the costs of the state borrowing and it's uh, going to even make borrowing harder to get, which is one of the big issues for us as well going into the future. So that's a major problem, because the banks, we've may maybe even wasted a year in trying to sort out the banks. That's one problem. The second problem is the problem of personal debt. Uh, we're worried very much at the moment about uh, the national debt, and I'll get to that in a second, but the major issue facing this country is personal debt, something that we didn't have in previous generations when they had major recessions. In the 1980s, a lot of people emigrated, not just because there was somewhere to go for, but because they weren't burdened by the mortgages that they actually held here and by negative equity. 
we have a situation, according to the latest central bank figures that I was looking at, where for principal private residents, there's 81 billion euro has been lent to Irish people for their homes, be it houses or apartments. This is nothing to do with investments. There's another 35, 40 million or so in relation to that, but 81 million. And when you consider that 60% of people actually have no mortgage on their home, on their house or apartment, mainly older people who tend to be on higher salaries anyway than younger people, and who are in a better position to cope, and especially as they don't have the mortgages and they've probably gone through the whole thing of rearing children and all the rest of it. We actually have an age divide in this economy, in this society coming. We keep talking about the public-private divide, but there's going to be a massive divide between people 50 plus who are largely debt free and those particularly in their 20s and 30s and early 40s who often have families and who are going to be in the worst position because of the personal debt that they're carrying. And there has been no suggestion yet of a NAMA for them. There's bailouts for the developers and for the banks, but there's nothing as yet to be done for the people who were encouraged by successive government policies to invest in buying property and were given tax incentives to do so through mortgage interest relief, particularly you know, seven year mortgage interest relief for first time buyers. So that, that hasn't been sorted out either, and that's something that's going to have to be done because an awful lot of young people are going to be in a really bad position and would go, I think, if they could actually sell their houses and apartments, but at the moment they actually can't. Sorry to be going on the depressing stuff. I will get to some positive stuff again later, I hope. So we have that. We have a major problem for industry and for jobs in this country, not just the escalating unemployment that we have at present, but I think things are getting worse because the stories I'm hearing about the behaviour of the banks in providing funding for all the rubbish and nonsense that's been spoken about them having money, and one guy recently, a very senior guy in Bank of Ireland at a conference I was speaking at, was talking about all the wonderful deposits they were bringing in, how they were boosting their capital base, more money in deposit than they had at the height of the SSIAs. They're not lending. I know of particular deals recently where Irish companies with reasonably strong balance sheets who had equity to put into deals and wanted to top it up with bank borrowing, as would be normal in any normally functioning economy. <coughs> and were being rejected. And because they couldn't get Irish banks to come in to do part of the funding on syndicates, then the overseas banks wouldn't do so either. So there is an absolute and utter crisis for Irish companies in relation to access for funding. And then, of course, we have the public finances problem on top of it as well. And the one thing that just strikes me as absolutely baffling is how many people who have seen how the excessive reliance on borrowing and the belief that cheap money could be borrowed in massive quantities and would be paid back with no problem, which has been one of the major problems in this country and which is one of the major themes that I try to develop in my book. And how, having seen that, what the damage that being overborrowed can do us is that the public policy now, which is one that's been particularly pushed by the trade unions, is borrow away out of trouble. I mean, we're arguing about getting four billion in cuts to our budget to try and claw back some of the deficit between what the state is taking in and its, in its taxes and what it's actually spending. And there's this belief, as has been articulated by David Begg and Nick too, that we can push it out to 2017 instead of 2014 as the European Commission, with its recent relaxation, is allowing us before coming back to 3% uh, 3, 3 exchequer borrowing requirement. And this belief that we will be able to borrow as if there's always going to be somebody out there, some international bankers, who will provide money to us and that we will be able to afford to pay it back is one thing that really worries me about the lack of reality that has been shown in relation to our borrowing situation. And it sort of reminded me last week, the uh, sort of this idea as well, in particular in relation to the um, solving our problems in relation to public sector pay. And this is no way having a go at anyone who works in the public sector. And I think this is one of the unfortunate things as well in the angry discourse that's going on at present is that when you sort of even look at figures about you know, the amount of money that's been spent by the state on pay and look at what we can afford and the rest of it, it isn't a question of trying to pick on anybody or trying to do anybody down. It's just a question of there is this massive gap that actually needs to be fixed. And when you look at uh, the reaction, the, the idea that you could actually get one year's savings by this 12 days unpaid leave and then go back in the following year to a position when we deal with next year, next year, when there has to be another four billion at least taken off uh, the, the deficit next year, it, it seems that some people just are almost as much in touch with reality as the FAI and looking to be added onto the World Cup as the 33rd team. <laughs> so that leads us to the budget on Wednesday, and Pat will probably be in a better position to address this than I am, but there are major issues, I think, in relation to the bravery of the Taoiseach, 
who doesn't have a track record in actually making tough decisions, who is deeply conservative and who tends to try and wait and see, wait and see what will happen. And, you know, I, I know Michael O'Leary isn't necessarily always a very popular person, but he has made the point, and I think it's a fairly good one. Can you imagine a private company facing the financial position like the state has been and just waffling on for 18 months about how to actually deal with it and how to make decisions and keep waiting and keep waiting in the hope almost that something will turn up? And we are seeing, you know, we sometimes get a lot of caught up in the whole thing about the interaction between politicians and government ministers and how they get on with each other. And, you know, a part of a lot of it will be the dynamic between Brian Cohen and Brian Lennon as to who's actually taking control and the dynamic between the uh, civil servants in the Department of Finance and those in the Department of Taoiseach as to who gets control. But ultimately, the decisions will let rest with Brian Cohen and his ministers. And you have to wonder, based on their track record, you know, they, they shape up on so many occasions to being ready to confront the issues and then they have a tendency to back down. So we'll have to see what happens on Wednesday. And I worry as well about, I worry about things like, for example, recently, the Farmley Initiative, whereby an awful lot of the failures of Irish life, the guys who are treated with extraordinary deference because they're wealthy, went up and started saying, well, we, you know, as if they had no responsibility for the mess we're in, but we're the guys, we have all the ideas to dig ourselves out. And I asked one government minister, and uh, I said, how many people under the age of 40 were a family? And momentarily, he couldn't answer, because this was on radio, live on radio. And then he said, oh, I think about 15, 20% of the people are under 40. I doubt if there was one person under the age of 40 there. In fact, I happen to know that there's a, a very good network of Irish professionals in the UK from people who've gone over in the last couple of decades, mainly in their late 20s, early 30s, uh, who have a very effective but low-key network in the UK of people, particularly in financial services. Not one of them was asked if they want to go to Farmley. It was all the same old faces, the same old people who, who slept walked us into this mess who are still telling us that they are the people who can actually get us out of the mess. And you might get a few changes at the top. Financial regulator, he goes. The boss of the central bank has changed. We have the same governments in charge. And the majority of the same people, the same influencers, the same holders of power are all in the positions that they were in. And the structures haven't changed, and the attitudes haven't changed, and the mindset hasn't changed. And most of the people who got us into the mess are still the people who are there. And they're telling us that they're the people who can get us out of the mess. I don't think so, but I'd love to hear what you want to th what you think of that in a few moments. Thank you. Thank you.